Hi, Guy. Oh, you need to unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, we can hear it you says, now. It says the host is muted, me. Oh, we can hear you now. You're okay, unmuted. excellent. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, okay, nice. So hi to everyone watching. Thank you for joining our first webinar. Very exciting to have you all with us. And thanks to Guy for joining us as well. Um, we have a really cool series of webinars coming up, so we're excited to have you with, with us. We have manta researchers, um, marine biologists, reef biologists, and underwater photographers and filmmakers over the coming weeks. So make sure you check back on our social media to check out some of our upcoming webinars. We're really excited to have Dr. Guy Stevens for our first webinar. He is the founder of the Manta Trust and one of the world's leading Manta experts. So for this webinar, we decided to host a Q&A session for the whole um, hour of the webinar so that you can ask him all of your burning Manta questions that you've been wanting to ask. Um, for the following webinars, we will have a presentation followed by questions. Um, but for guys, we're just gonna have an hour of questions about Mantas. So before I pass you over to Guy, I'm just gonna tell you a bit about how the webinars will work. You're all um, automatically muted and your videos are turned off. So we can't hear or see you. So don't worry about making any noises. Um, the webinar is gonna last between 45 minutes to one hour. We will try and get through as many questions as possible within that time. We've already compiled a list of questions that we've received from you via email um, and via social media. So thank you so much for everyone who sent in some really good questions. Um, and we'll try to get through these and then we will go on to some questions that we've received live. So if you have any questions throughout the talk, just pop them into the Q&A box, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will try and answer as many as possible. Um, the best view to watch this webinar is speaker view. So if you go into the top right hand corner, um, you should be able to change from gallery view to speaker view to watch the talk. Okay, so I will pass you on to Guy. He's gonna just introduce himself, I think. And if you can just tell us a bit about Manta Trust as well, Guy. Thanks, Flossie. Yes, so as, as Flossie said, my name is Guy Stevens. I'm the um, chief executive of the Manta Trust, uh, also the co-founder. I co-founded the charity with uh, Thomas Peshpak, who's a National Geographic uh, photographer, uh, about oh, almost 10 years ago now. And it all kind of grew out of um, projects that I was working on with colleagues all around the world um, and felt that there was a need to really sort of put everyone together um, to, to share ideas, to share research collaborations and to sort of drive a, a common goal to conserve manta rays um, and their relatives uh, globally. Um, and so, yeah, the charity was born and, you know, here we are now with about 25 different collaborators and projects all around the world. And hopefully we've been able to uh, achieve some, some really important and um, long lasting conservation gains for, for these animals. Okay, cool. Thanks, Guy. Um, we will move on to our first question. So the first question is from Tiki Fetterman via Instagram. I hope I'm saying it right. And they would like to know um, what the most curious um, thing you ever observed with manta rays was. What was your most memorable encounter? Well, so many to choose from. Um, I think one of the ones that will, will never, you know, um, leave me is, is actually from an encounter, uh, I think it was 2000, August 2008, so 12 years ago, it was in um, a place called Hanifaru Bay in the Maldives. It's uh, for many of you who, who've uh, who followed the Manta Trust and our work that we, that we do in the Maldives. It's one of the most uh, amazing locations to see big aggregations of, of feeding manta rays. And uh, it was actually uh, on one of these feeding aggregations that uh, I observed a manta that was, that was uh, clearly um, you know, entangled in lots of fishing line. It was late in the day, um, 
there was no one else around. I'd actually been uh, diving with a buddy um, and um, she'd got low on air, so she would come back to the boat. This was back in the days when, when diving was permitted inside Hany Fo. And I didn't have a knife with me and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't help this animal. And, and it was amazing to see how it, um, it actually swam away from the other animals and, and literally sort of hovered just a few inches above my head. And, you know, I could see that it was in a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, you know, pain from all these, these lines that were cut really deep down into its head. And, you know, I thought I've got to do something. So I went back to the boat. I got a dive knife. I had to change my cylinder, went back out to the site. So all this took about 20 minutes or so. And as I went back down again, this manta immediately swam over to me and I was able to sort of cut away the, the lines and pull it, uh, pull it free from its body. And, you know, that alone was something that was, you know, somewhat sad because it, it really did have horrific injuries, but also, you know, this, you know, intimacy that I, you know, experienced and the fact that the animal clearly was sort of soliciting um, uh, me for, uh, for help was something that, you know, really touched me. And then about a week later, I, you know, I told everyone about this story and I was back at the same location and we were in the water with another group of feeding animals. And all of a sudden, one of the mantas that was amongst this feeding group just sort of peeled off and swam directly over to me and sort of circled above my head for uh, just a couple of minutes and then went back to the, the feeding group again. And when I looked up and I, I could see it was the same manta ray, it was the same one that 10 days earlier that I'd cut all these lines away from. So, you know, obviously we kind of anthropomorphize and project our feelings onto these animals, but, you know, for me, that experience led me to believe that these are extremely, you know, curious, inquisitive, um, and certainly intelligent relative to, to other animals in the ocean, um, animals, and that they appear to have the ability to recognize humans as something that can help them, um, even when they're in, you know, lots of pain and in, in, in a position that would normally make a wild animal try to keep away from something like a human that they would perceive as a threat these animals are able to do the opposite and realize that a human can help them so that you know certainly um motivated me to you know even more to want to help protect these animals hey amazing story that's really cool i've had a few encounters the same where you can really tell that the mantis kind of looking at you and wondering what you are and interacting. Um, which is yeah, really and there's special. been, I mean, I've had it now maybe a dozen times, nothing like that, you know, that very first encounter where I was able to cut uh, an injured man to free from lines. But, you know, many of our colleagues who are on this, in listening to this webinar will have had similar experiences and probably some of the, uh, some of the public too, where you've actually had an animal swim up to you that's injured and that just allow you to cut it free is, is something that you know is very rare for a, for a wild animal. Very memorable. We actually have another question that's very uh, related to this. It's from Daniel. He's a dive instructor working in the Maldives and he sent this question via email. So Daniel said that he's um, witnessed two different entangled mantas approaching him for mm. help on dives. Um, both times he's tried to help and at the last minute when he's been about to unentangle them, the manta has got scared and swam away. Um, so he's wondering if you have any advice for how best to approach a manta so that it doesn't get scared and he can help them in the future. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a good question. And, and you know, I've had the similar experience. It's, um, I mean, it, this is another, you know, side point, but every manta ray is different. And we, we all know this, you know, having spent a lot of time in the water with them, that they have different personalities and some of them are more bold than others. Um, so you kind of have to read the behavior of the animal you have to see how it's reacting um generally i've learned that slower is better so don't if you see an animal that's injured and you see that it looks like it's you know clearly trying to sort of stay relatively close to you maybe even come towards you and then start to turn away as you go towards it the best thing you can do is actually just give the manta the time that it needs to come to you uh, and then when it does don't go in fast with any rapid movement and try to grab hold of the line because actually I found that pulling on the line itself will cause the animal to to react and, and sort of swim away and as soon as it reacts that the tension on the line increases uh, and then it feels probably the, the, the hook or the pain um, stronger so 
I've actually found that just trying to go really slowly um, and try to um, get the confidence a bit more of the animal. And then I actually found that putting my hand on the animal itself, on the head, usually where the hook's caught around the top jaw or on the wing, and sort of just slowly touching it in that area before I get the knife to try and actually cut the line. And if you can get to that point where you can actually sort of, you know, get close enough to touch the animal without it reacting, then I do it very quickly. Uh, and then, because all you need to do is cut the line, you don't need to worry about actually trying to remove the hook because that is usually a lot harder um, and the, the hooks will rust and fall out. It's the, it's the line that does the damage because it gets caught around the body, you know, it cuts like cheese wire, it cuts down into the, into the skin. So actually, you know, slowly, slowly is the best approach. And, you know, sometimes you just can't, you just can't get to them. Sometimes they don't, they don't want, uh, they won't allow you to, to help them. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm sure that'll be useful for Daniel. Um, we have a cool one from Charlotte. Charlotte wants to know where your love for manta rays came from, Guy. Well, I've, um, I've always loved the natural world. I grew up in the countryside in the southwest of, of the UK. I, um, you know, I started watching David Attenborough on TV, I think as, um, as many of the, the folks listening to this call um, have done also. And, you know, I started to see these amazing documentaries about coral reefs and the, the tropical diving locations around the world. And, and, you know, I had aquariums growing up. I, you know, had dozens of them around the house. I was breeding fish and I always wanted to, you know, be able to go out into the, into the, the ocean and into the, the, the natural world to see these animals for myself. And, and it was, you know, having graduated from my undergraduate degree in marine biology in Plymouth University in the UK. I got a job working in the Maldives. Um, couldn't believe it was a you know a job that someone was prepared to pay me to go and to go and dive and um, you know free dive and snorkel with manta rays. Um, I was taking guests on excursions to to snorkel and dive on the reefs. And one of the the first weeks I was there, I was taking people out to see manta rays, and it blew my mind. They were just you know instantly captivating there's something extremely charismatic about them they're obviously big they're beautiful but there's very few animals that allow you to come that close to them in the wild especially animals in the underwater world i mean you know we've got whale sharks we've got dolphins and whales but actually very few of them will let you get that close to them uh, most wild big animals you know are you know a little bit um reserved in in you know getting close to a, you know, a big uh, bubbly or noisy person. So the fact that you could, you know, have these close interactions with these very curious animals and the fact that you could recognize every individual, I quickly started to try and recognize them and learn them and, you know, try and um, collect them and sort of recognize the individuals I was seeing. So that's, that's really how I, how I fell in love with them. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, we have a good question from Emily here. She's 12 years old and she emailed in to ask, where do manta rays sleep? Where do they sleep? Well, I guess the answer to that is they don't really sleep in the way that, that we do. Uh, and this is actually quite normal for a lot of marine animals. They, they sort of will go into a, almost like an autopilot mode. And um, what we suspect, because we don't know actually what they're, what they're doing. What we suspect is they they sort of go into an autopilot and just probably cruise around um, in uh, in the the open water. They don't rest on the seabed. So manta rays are born into a life of motion. So they they keep swimming from the, the second they're born to the second they die. They can't rest on the bottom, uh, and they so therefore they would just slowly um, cruise around. Um, and they would rest parts of their brain. So they would go into sort of an inactive mode for their active kind of socializing or, or foraging um, kind of aspect of their, uh, of their consciousness. But they would still be alert to the, for example, the threat to predation. Okay, cool. Very interesting. Um, what should we do next? There's quite a few people who want to know more about manta reproduction. Um, we do have a webinar coming up on the 14th of May with Neve Froman, who is going to be talking about 
manta ray reproductive ecology who's currently doing a PhD studying this um, but we'll ask Guy a couple of questions Jenny asked via email um, what is known about where and when mantas give birth yeah another another one of those questions I would love to know the answer in more detail myself um, you know we we've never seen no one's ever recorded a natural birth in the wild of a manta ray so there's been one individual that's given birth in captivity. Um, she was in an aquarium in, uh, in Okinawa in, uh, in Japan, Churumai Aquarium. And she gave birth, I think, to five pups, you know, in kind of quick succession um, year after year. And so they're able to document the, the, the reproduction um, of manta rays in captivity and they were able to watch her give birth um, obviously they're in an aquarium so you know that's where she's giving birth um, but in the wild we suspect that the females probably go into uh, protected uh, habitats in areas where we often see the the pups the newborns so the pups are often Maldives as an example would be in these protected inner lagoons of the reef systems themselves whereas the adults tend to be more along the channels and the outer reef areas the little pups are in these little shallow lagoons, you know, where they're sort of 20 meters deep, surrounded by reef, um, less predation from big shark predators in those locations. So it seems sensible to me that the big heavily pregnant females, when they're close to giving birth, would go to these locations, possibly at nighttime, but not necessarily, um, uh, and, and give birth. And it happens very quickly. So, you know, you know, the female can literally go there, give birth within a couple of minutes, and then she will leave the, the pup um, and head back to her um, her normal habitat. Um, so they don't stay with the pup. So it's not like we would likely to see these females in these areas um, with pups or um, spending time in an area where they would be uh, giving birth. So that's the best answer is we think that the where is, is mangroves areas, protected lagoons, um, anywhere where there's um, less risk of predation to these little pups. Um, and the when, um, we don't really know, but because mantis in most locations tend to have some seasonality to their reproduction, we think that the, the birthing is often coincided with these, these seasonal peaks in mating and reproductive activity. Okay, very cool, thank you. We've had a few questions about Sri Lanka. Um, some people are wondering what kind of work we do in Sri Lanka or India, where we know that some species of manta and mobulus are um, actively hunted um, and yeah what kind of work we have focused here to protect the mantas well I mean they're they're two countries which yes have have large fisheries for for manta and devil rays and you know those those fishing fleets often extend quite a large distance away from um, the shorelines of those countries so for example the Sri Lankan offshore fishing fleet will they go out um, quite large distances through the Indian Ocean um, into international waters to, um, to to fish, just like many, many, in fact, most um, fishing nations around the world do. And um, and so, what we're trying to do in those locations is is record the fisheries, try to monitor what's being caught, and try to work with those governments to implement more. Uh, protective measures and protections uh, are, are hard to achieve policy is a, a big part of what we do and you know policy is 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 wrapped up in politics and you often have to understand how you're going to make the change based on the political situation at the time um, and with Sri Lanka and India uh, we have been working for many years to achieve national level protection um, to try and prevent these fisheries but you know it's a challenging uh, process I mean over the years we've managed to work with in-country partners and, and lots of other NGOs to achieve national level protection in the Maldives uh, in Indonesia in Thailand in Peru um, Ecuador um, so you know it's possible um, those were all countries that were fishing mantas beforehand uh, with the exception of, of the Maldives and so you know, it's definitely something we're trying to achieve, but it's it's not easy at the moment in in both those countries. It does look like that um, India might um, might go down the protection route soon. Um, Sri Lanka, we're hoping for for similar results, but you know that's almost like the first step on the rung because you're going to need to get the actual 
you know, top-down protection in place. You need to say that it's now illegal to capture or kill these animals, but you're still going to have problems of bycatch mortality. You're still going to have um, illegal fisheries, and those all still occur in countries like Indonesia, where we do have protections for manta, but not for mobular in uh, devil rays in Indonesia. So it's a, it's a long process, um, and we're certainly trying to do more in Sri Lanka. We realize it's an area where there's large fisheries, and um, and we want to try and find the best route to achieving greater protection, whether that's from um, reducing trade, therefore trade is stopped, the fisheries mm -hmm. stop, or whether it's from trying to incentivize fishing to change from, say, a fishing practice that captures more manta as bycatch to a, another fish, a fishing practice that's more sustainable, which then might reduce mortality of mantas, which then is an easier route to real term conservation than trying to just get a piece of paper that says they're protected um, by the, the government, um, because that doesn't necessarily mean that you've protected them in principle, even if you've got a piece of paper that says they're, they're protected. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, we would like to know more. This is from Haley. Um, she's one of our Cyclone members, and she would like to know if mantas stay with their partners after they've reproduced. Uh, so I think I kind of touched on this already, um, and um, the answer, the short answer is no. Um, like all uh, elasma branks, all sharks and rays, there is no parental care. So when the females give birth, um, in some of the uh, the shark and ray species, they actually lay egg cases, which then hatch and are independent. But a lot of them give birth to live young. This is the case for mantas. So they give birth to to live pups, just one pup at a time. And as soon as the pup's born. Um, they swim away from the, the mother, or more likely the mother swims away from them, and then that's it. They're, they're there to look after themselves. There's, um, you know, they're fully, uh, fully formed. They're not like a lot of mammals when they're born, which need to, to be looked after by their parents. They're very vulnerable. Um, they can't take care of themselves. For the manta ray, they're one and a half plus, sometimes up to sort of 1.9, even two meters in wingspan when they're born. They're already very large. They're perfectly capable of of, um, of fending for themselves. Okay. So yeah, there's no there's no mother um, offspring care, and there's no long term associations between individuals. They don't hang out in family groups either. They're they're independent in individual animals that aggregate in certain key hotspots. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I've definitely had some cool encounters with pups that are very curious. Yeah. It's like yeah. seeing pups out in the field yeah, those they're really awesome I, mean, I, I remember last year you you guys had an amazing encounter with one and the pups are yeah. that i guess that you know like babies of of most animals that it's like for the first time you've seen something that's kind of new and exciting and they they react in a way that clearly demonstrates that level of curiosity that for the bigger older animals and certainly in locations like the Maldives where they're, they're used to seeing people all the time um the the adults are just like oh it's another diver it's another human but for the little pups they they come and swim around you and they kind of flip upside down and check you out and spend you know half an hour just interacting with you and that's that that's a really special experience when that happens yeah they're some of my favorite encounters um we've had a couple of really interesting questions about how covid will affect mantas so the first one is from one of our youngest and most dedicated supporters. He's called Harrison. I think you might have heard of him before. Yeah. Hi, Harrison, <laughs> if you're listening. Thanks um, for the question. So Harrison wants to know if with coronavirus, mantas are at greater risk for their gills or if the fishing trade has declined because of travel restrictions. I mean, the short answer is we don't know. It's, a, it's certainly an area of concern. Um, we... You know, we can't go out and about as researchers. Um, we have colleagues that we collaborate with in various places around the world who monitor the fisheries in the landing sites. We we're just talking about that with Sri Lanka and India. Yeah. Um, and we also have colleagues that go to the other end of the, the trade. So that would be the, um, the actual stores in, in mostly in, in mainland China where most of the gill plates end up being uh, traded to to try and you know, record the level of the trade um, that still exists, even though, of course, the trade is meant to be restricted. We're still trying to understand what amount of, um, of fisheries and trade is occurring. So right now, we, we can't go out and actually record that. Um, I, I would suspect that 
the fishing industry is still fishing um, and the trade is still going on, I wouldn't think that it's made any difference to the amount. I wouldn't say that the COVID is allowing for greater fisheries to occur. And I don't know if, if fishing has been curtailed and reduced because of the concerns of the, the, you know, the fisher folks, whether that's an industry that has been restricted in their ability to go out and fish. So the answer is it could have had a reduction in fisheries or it could have had an increase, but we don't really know the answer. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to find out once this we is all over. Yeah, we certainly plan to try and record, you know, collect more data and find out. Yeah. And um, there's another cool one about Corona. So Megan is asking if you think the mantas in Hanifaru Bay will recognize that there's no tourists around to bug them. Yeah, well, I mean, at the moment, there won't actually be any honey for, uh, mantas in Hanifaru Bay. It's a, it's a location that seasonally attracts manta rays during the southwest monsoon, so they don't start turning up there to forage um, or even really to visit the bay at all until about um, May. Usually about mid-May, they start to come back. And so we will, we will start to know the answer to that question um, in a month or so from now. Um, but um, more broadly, it's another area that we're really interested in, in following up on because certainly um, all around the world, most diving activities have been banned or restricted. In the Maldives, all diving has been stopped. All um, uh, tourism activities have been greatly reduced. This means that the amount of boats that are speeding backwards and forwards across the atolls, which cause a huge amount of noise pollution. Noise pollution is something that really is not talked about much in terms of um, the impacts in, in, in onto animals like manta rays and, and other um, marine animals. Um, so there's, there's a huge reduction in, in movement of people in boats, which will be reducing noise pollution, which I'm sure will be a big, uh, a big benefit to the animals underwater. And just the lack of people going down to these cleaning sites and to these, these feeding aggregation sites, the ones that are still active at this time of year um, all around the world, because of course the mantas are still foraging in, in some locations. So the mantas in those locations, I am sure are enjoying the break. Um, it's something that we would love to be able to be able to, to monitor right now. But again, all of our research activities are restricted, um, quite rightly so. Uh, and we're not allowed out and about, but we wish we could because I am sure we will see some interesting changes in the underwater world as a result of these restrictions. And it hopefully when we are allowed back, we will be trying to record those changes um, because of course tourism is not just gonna like a switch turn back on again. And so we would like to see uh, and, and use that opportunity to gather information, to use it to say, look, this is proof that tourism does have a, an impact on these animals' lives. And we suspect that those impacts probably are not good uh, and therefore that it needs to be managed and, and it needs to be effectively um, managed, you know, before the degradational impacts of, of of tourism, which are often seen as an overall benefit to manta rays, um, which of course they do have many benefits, but we need to make sure that we also um, make sure that they're they're not harming the animals or loving them to death, essentially. Yeah, there's actually a question related to this we have from Louise. Um, she is a diver and she says she finds it frustrating, even though she's a tourist, to see lots of other boats and divers at one site that might be disturbing the mantas. She wants to know how you see manta conservation being able to both protect manta sites and allow people to enjoy these um, awesome experiences. Yeah, it's a, it's a trade-off. You know, people, yeah. you know, for, for the work that we do, it's, it's really important that we connect people to these animals. And we see manta rays as a, you know, is a charismatic species that people can really empathize with. The best way to get people to care about something is to get them to feel like they're connected to it. Um, one of the best ways to do that with any animal is to get people to spend close, you know, time in the company of those animals. Um, if you get into the wild and you have one of those close encounters with a manta ray, you instantly create someone who cares about them and wants to protect them. Divers are a huge part of the uh, the community that, that is vocally out there pushing to protect these animals. So we don't want to say, look, you can't interact with them. But of course, there is a point at which the, the level of interaction starts to 
to impact negatively these animals to such a degree that you need to step in with some kind of management and say, look, we need to control the level of, of exposure that these animals are facing. And at these key aggregation sites, which are very important for the manta rays, the feeding stations, these foraging aggregation sites like Hany Furrow, there needs to be control. You know, tourism, humans are, are you know, expanding around the world and encroaching on the natural world at a rate never seen before. And so we need governments like the Maldives or governments like you know, Australia on the Barrier Reef or you know, Thailand, wherever manta tourism occurs, there needs to be effective management plans that need to be put in place by governments because just doing it voluntarily doesn't work. Um, we've created codes of conduct, we've conducted studies to try and quantify um, the impacts of tourism on these animals and we've tried to put in place our recommendations which are science-based to say, look, please adhere to these regulations and these apply to tourists, these apply to operators and they're available on our website. We've created videos, and, but you know, that's one thing, giving the information but making people comply is, is something that is, is, uh, is another level that we are really, uh, you know, that's one of our key focuses in the Maldives where the mantas are not fished, but the biggest threat to them, um, direct, you know, uh, threat in the near term future is, is tourism. So absolutely, it's an important area for us to focus. Okay, cool, thank you. We've got a good question from Sarah. She's eight years old and she would like to know how long manta rays live for. Hi Sarah, yeah, good question. Um, again, we definitively don't know the answer, but we are starting to sort of piece together the jigsaw puzzle to build now a pretty good estimation of their, their longevity, their lifespan. And we think that it's around about 40, 50 years. And we were able to do that because, um, as many of you listening will know, manta rays have these unique spot patterns, and these spot patterns are like a fingerprint. They don't change throughout the animal's lifetime. So once we capture an animal, we take a picture of it, or we, or we video it, we can actually then say, okay, we've seen Bubbles the Manta. Uh, Bubbles the Manta was first seen in you know, 1995. Here we go now. 10, 20, 30 years later, and in some cases, in some locations where people have been in the oceans looking at manta rays for many, many years, they have now got repeat sightings of some animals over 30 plus years. So this is in places like um, um, Socorro and the other Revilla Jajito Islands in Mexico, in places like Hawaii, um, in the east coast of Australia and the Maldives, we all have individuals which have been sighted for, for 30 plus years. And because we know that these animals take around about um, a decade or a little bit longer probably for females to reach sexual maturity, if you first sight an animal that's already mature, you can say, okay, you can add 10 years to the front end of that. And so by doing that, we now know that some of these animals are around about um, you know, 40 plus years old. And you know, we know that other animals that over years we stop sighting, we can assume that they've probably died because um, they were, you know, they've just disappeared from when they were frequently sighted. And so putting that all together, uh, we can roughly estimate that that's likely to be their longevity. It could be longer. Um, we need, we'll know, we know another 10 years and we'll have a much better idea of, of the answer to that question. And I would add one more thing is that in many, um, um, species, you can actually age them by looking at growth rings on their bones. Um, Telios fishes, you can look at the ear bones. Uh, in sharks and rays, some people have done it by looking at vertebra. It doesn't seem to work very well for manta rays. So no one's really been able to accurately age manta rays using growth rings by looking at vertebra of dead animals. But the photo ID is, is the best estimates we've, we've got. Okay, cool. Sarah has one more question. She said she's adopted three mantas. One wow. of them is Baba or Baba Ganoush. Um, mm -hmm. And she's wondering if you know how he's doing. Baba, well, last time we saw Baba, I think would have been the, I mean, he's a Hani Faru manta. So he's one of the, the regulars. He's one of our most cited mantas. Plus, you probably were one of the last people to see Baba. Yeah. Where, he was he? He around a lot um, last season. So the season ended last November, but we saw him really, really regularly, um, doing great in lots of feeding chains, just, yeah, always hanging around inside Hanifara Bay. Yeah, so fingers crossed he's doing well. I mean, that was, 
you know, going back to the problems with boat traffic again, obviously we've got the noise pollution, but I mean, we're seeing a, a, an increase in the number of animals that are being hit by boats as more and more speedboats rush around the world. Um, these speedboats don't have protective guards on the propellers. Um, they're going at crazy speeds. I mean, the, the analogy I use is, you know, how crazy would it be if we allowed cars to drive at 70 miles an hour through national parks or on land? Mm -hmm. And yet in national parks, in the oceans, in the Maldives, they're driving through them like crazy. Um, so we have these key aggregation sites where there's meant to be restrictions on speedboat limits uh, and areas outside the the protected areas where there's no restrictions um, where these boats are traveling at, at really high knots you know 30 plus knots 35 knots which you know even a manta ray which are relatively quick to react to approaching um, threats like speedboats are still getting hit and baba is one of the you know the the unfortunate um, recipients of one of those collisions and um, he's the lucky one. He survived. Unfortunately, we don't know how many more are dying because, you know, when they get hit, these animals sink. So if, if they're being hit and, uh, and then sinking to the seabed, we, we don't know if, if they're being killed from, from these collisions more regularly. Okay, cool. Yeah, Baba's one of the favorite mantas. Very happy that he survived. Um, we've had a couple of anonymous questions asking if the Manta Trust discovered Honey Faro Bay or if people <laughs> knew about it before. Obviously, they did. So, yeah, obviously. I mean, look, Honey Faro Bay is, it's, you know, it's a location in the Maldives which is close to, you know, several local islands. Maldivians have been going out and exploring the reef systems ever since they first uh, arrived in the archipelago, um, you know, thousands of years ago. And you know, the local fishermen, when I first went there in you know, 2003, uh, and when I first moved full time to Biatol in 2006, and I started going and chatting to the local fishermen, of course, you know, they were like, yeah, there's this, there's this location which we used to go in and we used to hunt whale sharks there. The last whale sharks were hunted there in 2006. It was an area where they used to go out, and they, before they had motorized vehicles, they used to go out with their rowing boats, and they used to catch the, the whale sharks. Um, and they needed the oil to help, you know, waterproof their um, their boats. So this was back, you know, in the in the time before they, they didn't have modern, you know, chemical sealants that are, you know, much cheaper and easier to procure. So, so Maldivians, the fishermen, have known about this location. Um, I just tapped into that knowledge. Um, I asked my colleagues, my Maldivian friends, and I said, "Look, where's a good place to find mantas?" And and they told me about it. Um, I think there's a sort of a distinction between found or discovered Hani Faru. I don't think anyone should or, or can claim to have discovered it. It's, it was, you know, an area that the animals um, visit. Um, all I did was tell everyone, you know, this is a good place to see them. I figured out when was the best time to go there and find them. Um, and, you know, I started researching them. Um, there's been plenty of divers and dive groups that have been there before that, before me. Um, so I, I certainly don't claim, and I don't think you, well, I know you will never find anything anywhere that for me has ever claimed to have discovered Hany Faru uh, Bay. I've never said it, and I don't, you know, I don't care to say that I've discovered it because it's not really about that anyway. Yeah, it's nice to think of it as being discovered by the mantas a long time exactly. ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the fishermen told me amazing scenes, you know, they used to, they said there used to sometimes be tiger sharks would be in, in there mm -hmm. when they would, you know, hunt the hunt the, the whale sharks and you know things have changed i mean those fish those guys who you know it was amazing they would show me they brought out the old equipment that they used to, to hunt the animals i mean they're all now employed in the tourism industry or have you know children who are employed in the tourism industry i mean the maldives has changed and you know the animals are still there throughout all of this and i hope that they'll be there for many more years to come um, we need to just uh, ensure that whether it's fisheries or tourism, that we preserve and respect that location for the future generations of the Maldives, but also for the animals as well. So, you know, there's going to be many more um, changes and, and, you know, future people that will come and, um, you know, explore this location. Um, and it's a special place, and I hope that it remains that way for the animals. Yeah, me too. It's a very special place. Um, Okay, we have a question from Carmen, and she would like to know what the purpose of a manta ray's tail is, and if it falls off, can it grow back? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good one, actually. Um, the answer is the purpose of the tail, it's when they're born, actually, the tail is very, very long. It's, a, it's as long as they are wide. So, you know, two meter man to pup will have like a two meter long tail. And over its lifespan, what happens is the tail gets shorter and shorter. Um, it, uh, it gets nibbled away. We often see the mantas when they're at cleaning stations, the little cleaner fish are nibbling at the end of the tail. It often looks like a frayed rope. So the sort of the end is sort of a little bit red and sore. Um, trigger fish will come in and nip at the end and the manta ray obviously sort of freaks out because it's got, you know, a munch taken out of the, the cartilage of the tail. So what we generally see is the older the manta ray is, the shorter the tail. So you can somewhat um, talk about age being associated with le tail length, but of course, at various points in an animal's life, the tail might get broken off short when it's very young, it might get bitten off short, um, and the tail is there to help defend them against the patient from behind. It's a bit like having an early warning system trailing out behind you. Mantas can't see directly behind them, and sharks tend to try and attack them from behind. And so if a shark is sneaking up on them, um, its tail is sticking out and the shark might actually touch the, or get close to the tip of the tail and the mantle will sense that. And it gives it that extra split second to be able to accelerate away or try and take evasive action from a predation. So um, the tail is there as a, as a defensive mechanism, but it has no spine in it, has no other function that itself other than being a sort of an early warning system. Okay, very cool. There's a question from Violet. That oh, and I should say, it oh, can't sorry. grow back. It can't grow back. Oh, yes, we missed that part. Yeah. Um, Violet wants to know about manta rays natural predators. So you touched on sharks there, but are there any other natural predators? Yeah, um, all the big, you know, really big predation, um, predating sharks that you can think of in the tropical oceans where mantas occur. So, you know, Great white sharks, although their overlap of the range is not as as um, as widespread as, for example, tiger sharks. The bull sharks, tiger sharks, great hammerheads, so not not scalloped hammerheads because they feed on smaller fish. Um, and then for the pups, there'll also be some uh, smaller shark species that undoubtedly would try to predate on them too. So it's the big sharks that you know, as I mentioned, the bulls, the tigers, the great hammerhead. Um, great whites, and then it's the, the marine predator, predating cetaceans. So orcas, orcas have been documented killing manta rays, false killer whales, false killer whales are kind of, um, you know, uh, also prevalent predators of, of, of large fish in the oceans. We've actually documented them hunting manta rays. Um, and so, yeah, false killer whales, orcas, um, uh, for the adults and, and big sharks, those are the main, main threats. Okay, cool. Um, we have another one from Louise. She's um, wondering, because she knows that mantas are very intelligent and social, um, she says, do they sort of hang out in groups? Um, I know there was a paper published recently where it showed some associations between different manta um, genders and ages. So have you got any ideas about this? Yeah, that study was done in, in Raja Ampat and, it, and we've done a similar study and have actually, you know, um, something that we're in process of publishing. It's actually been submitted to the journal and we're, you know, hoping that it'll come out relatively soon, mm -hmm. which somewhat um, complements that study and extends the length of the observation over a longer period. And, and what we're seeing is that Yes, there are associations, but these associations are relatively short term and they are likely to be a function of these animals utilizing the same habitat. Um, so the way that we kind of look at it is that the, um, the mantas all tend to have um, quite high fidelity to, to locations. So they will um, spend time often repeatedly going back to the same feeding or cleaning stations and that therefore many of those individuals will often be at these locations at the same time as these uh, as other animals that also consider that location to be their their home um, and that within those animals that aggregate there there does appear to be some um, amount of, of of structure but that I would say generally and over the course of these animals' lives, and even over the course of, of anything outside of just a couple of, of months, there are no long-term associations. There are no family or social groupings. We can still consider manta rays to ultimately be 
at individuals that do not spend considerable long-term associations with other animals, that, that other individuals. Yeah, okay, very interesting. Um, we have a question from one of our Cyclone members, he's called Nick, and he is asking how manta rays might be affected by plastic pollution, plastics been a big topic the last couple of years so yeah plastic is a you know it's a, an area of growing awareness i think most people you know now in the public realize that our use of plastics is completely um wasteful um environmentally damaging and something that we should be curtailing yeah, certainly single-use plastics and i wholeheartedly would be part of the the the, the efforts to try and um push for that agenda. We need to reduce the amount of plastic that we're, that we're um, producing and, and then discarding. And of course, discarded plastic ends up in the oceans and that's a pollutant and that pollutant can, can have you know, big impacts to some species. Now, for mantas, I think the answer specifically is that they are less impacted um, than many other big filter feeding animals. The good news for mantas is that they, um, they have the ability to uh, vomit um, up anything that's within their stomach and they can actually avert their stomach through their mouth. There's some great videos if, you, if anyone's interested in looking at videos of, uh, of vomiting mantas or vomiting sharks, you can actually see them regurgitate things up through their mouth. And then at the other end, they actually do the same thing with their, um, uh, with their intestines, they can actually squirt them a bit like a party blower out through their intestines. People often see this dive as at cleaning stations. The mantas seem to do it quite frequently there, where they will actually you know, squirt out, you know, almost a foot of their intestines out through their anus, that with a cloacal opening. And this is a way for them to clean up parasites and to dislodge any food or uh, undigested exoskeletons of uh, prey um, that are inside their intestines, but also out through their stomach as well. So they have ability to cough up or get rid of anything that might be tucked inside the, their body. So that kind of deals with the problem of, of macro plastic. And we tend to think of plastic um, as, a, as a problem at, at different scales. It's the big stuff that physically gets trapped in animals. And when it gets trapped in them, like inside a turtle or inside a, a whale, it can't get rid of it. Therefore, it blocks them up and they die because they get intestinal blockages. Uh, so that's something that I don't think that mantas are, are suffering from. But we don't really have a huge amount of evidence to, to go around and chop up the insides of mantas to see. We've been trying to look, but a, a lot of the time the intestines are discarded at sea before the animals are brought back to um, the fish markets and there's nowhere we're gonna go and chop up a live animal just to see how much plastic is inside it. Um, so we don't know definitively, but I suspect that the answer is they're not being too impacted by big plastic. The mantas are not stupid. They don't go and swallow a big plastic bag. They avoid getting it into their mouth and we see them, you know, spit it out even if it does go inside the, the mouth itself. So the answer that for the smaller microplastics, there's again a lot of bad science unfortunately out there which is suggesting that, um, that, that toxins from microplastics are um, having significant impacts on animals in the ocean. And there's no evidence, certainly for manta rays, that microplastics are having any significant impact. Now, there may well be some impact, but to try and, to try and get to the bottom of what those impacts will be will be very, very difficult to ever assess on wild animals. And what my particular position is, and that of the manta trust, is there's all these threats these animals are facing. Climate crisis is right up there as the biggest threat. We've got these targeted fisheries, we've got bycatch fisheries, we've got tourism. All of these things are, are things that I'm really concerned about that we really need to address. Where does plastic come on this level for manta rays? It's way down there on that list. So, you know, there may be some level of concern, but really when I'm talking about where we're gonna put our effort to strategize about conservation of these animals and their habitats, plastic is not on that list of, of major concerns. But Broadly, for the for the oceans and for the way that humans live our lives, plastic is a big problem that we need to address. But it's not it's not specific for mantas. Okay, thank you for that. That's good news then. Um, I remember seeing. So I'm, the I'm just I'm looking at the time and I'm seeing like we can either extend it or we can do more. I can do more rapid fire answers. I'm conscious. I don't want to like, I want to get through questions so I can, if you want, I can try and speed up things and go a bit okay. quicker. Yeah. yeah let's do a you. bit speedier. Um, we do have a lot of questions, but some of them are 
um, very similar. So we have some questions about the color morphs. Um, Maureen asked about whether black manta rays can be reef or oceanic manta rays or whether there are different species. Um, and we've had a couple of people ask about the pink manta as well. So maybe you can the tell us about manta. the color morphs. Yeah, I mean, color morphs is a really fascinating area of, um, uh, of research. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's quite a detailed sort of interest of mine, but uh, I won't go into it in, in too much uh, here and now. For those that are interested more, there's, there's lots of information in, in, the, um, in the various books that I've written about, about manta rays, and I think you can find some information on our website too. But the, the short answer is that think about black manta rays or melanistic manta rays is a little bit like um, uh, black panther. Black panther is um, a dark color version of a, a leopard if you if it's in Africa or, or Asia um, or a jaguar if it's in Central South America so they're not different species it's just a an animal that has much larger amounts of melanism uh, in the pigmentation of the animals so black manta rays are genetically um, the same species as um, uh, the other animals that are within that population. Um, so if it's a black reef manta ray in Raja Ampat, it's no, it's no different to a chevron or a melanistic manta. A melanistic manta is the opposite scale. So that's an animal that has less melanism, so it's much paler. Um, and so this sliding scale of coloration, it's a natural variation that we find in the animals, just like there's a natural variation in their, in their spottiness as well. Very spotty animals to very pale animals with less spots. Um, so yeah, that's the short answer-ish. <laughs> okay. The short answer. Thank you. And the, um, pink, the pink yeah, manta, the pink one, that's another, just another color anomaly. So it's an animal that has um, a large increase in a particular pigmentation that's resulted in it being this kind of almost uh, pinkish hue all over the body. So it's a very rare color mutation. And, you know, there, you know, there's lots of these mutations that occur in lots of species. If you just Google uh, melanism or leucistic animals, you can see all kinds of varieties that occur in, in lots of different species. And, and for mantas, this, this mutation or these variations have occurred and have been something that have persisted in populations probably because there's um, a lack of culling through natural predation on those animals. Whereas most animals conform to a, quite a tight color variation because predation often, or, or the need to be camouflaged, makes them stay within a relatively small range of patterning. Yeah, okay, cool. The pink manta was awesome. And um, we do have a talk coming up from Asia Haynes from Project Manta in Australia. And she's going to tell us a bit more about that pink manta. And yeah. um, that should be on the 29th of May. I'm We've still hoping... Got... Sorry. I'm still hoping to find a, a blue manta sometime. Yeah, or oh, I'd take a pink one in the Maldives any yeah, day. Yeah, that would be cool. Oh, I want to see an albino one. I mean, sooner or later, there must be, an, there probably will be an albino manta that arrives or turns up sometime. Yeah. You know, um, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be incredible. Um, I think we'll go for one more question. Um, and a lot of people have asked about this. They want to know this. What this original question actually came from Pavlina on Instagram, but lots of people are asking how they can help, how they can volunteer for the Manta Trust, and how they can work with the Manta Trust, and if they can do any work online to help us during this time. Yeah, well, I mean, we we have various volunteer programs all around the world. I think the Maldives is the one that we take the most interns and volunteers um, every year. Um, obviously, this year with what's going on, we're not really sure what's going to happen. Um, for that program. You can apply to our internship um, on our website. You can, I think there's a specific page that uh, Simon, our colleague, has created that allows you to go and see the various um, internship programs we have. We take on a lot of students too, master students usually, to do desk-based projects um, or to do in-the-field uh, projects. We support PhD programs as well. I think right now there's four or five different PhD projects that we're co-funding or, or supervising or, and or supervising. So you can certainly contact us um, and get you know, uh, more specific um, information if you have an idea or you'd like to, to, um, to, to volunteer, you can find that information on, on our website. Employment, where well, we put out jobs with various uh, um, you know, organizations that, you know, for example, um, um, 
infrastructure. I think Wise Oceans, I think, usually promote our jobs and, and other locations. And we, we normally very quickly get inundated with applications. And obviously, we don't have too many positions that open up too frequently. But um, certainly, if you're on the lookout through those kind of environmental job websites and you see one come up, then that's, that's where we would post them. So, yeah. And you know, we're we're always we try to always respond to anyone that if someone emails me or comes through to the inbox, we will try to always get back to a student or anyone that's got any questions about how they can help. But we do we have tried to put those resources up there on our website um, so that hopefully most of those answers can be addressed um, by looking um, at our information online. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And if you want to. Um, if you want to have a career in, in, you know, looking at manta rays, researching them, conserving them, you know, go to university, get a degree in marine biology, get a master's, um, you know, that's the route that you definitely should take. Um, we, we would definitely employ more likely to employ people who have got a career in marine biology. Yeah, true. There's a lot of people interested, so I'm sure they'll be pleased to know that there's internships um, usually available, hopefully starting later this year or next year again. I mean, that's how you, that's how you got into the, the position, yeah. right, Floss? I mean, you came that's to a master's at York where, you know, I was um, you know, doing my PhD and, you know, you know, you came out and did a master's project and, you know, that grew to offering you a position to work that now you've expanded into this really fantastic education program. So, you know, I think that, you know, that is a really good route for people who are interested. It's, yeah. yeah. So many people working for the Maldivian project did start as interns. So I always tell people when they ask about the internship, it's one of the best internships to do where you'll be sort of almost guaranteed a job if, if you do a good job um, at some point in the future. So it's a good place to start. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know what you think about that. <laughs> I was, there, I was there, mm, did, how did you get a job? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, um, that is just about all we've got time for today. Um, we do have loads more information on our website, so I'm just gonna share with you now. Um, oh, this is not working. Um, I can share with you some information um, on our website, just one second. Here we go. Um, so you can see our website here. We've got loads more information on manta biology, on threats to manta rays, on how you can help manta rays. Um, a lot of the questions were related to specific countries, Maldives, Sri Lanka. We do have loads of talks coming up from the project leaders in those countries. Um, Guy's also holding up a book. We did have a few questions about which books we can read to learn more about mantas. So this one's called Manta and Devil Rays of the World. Um, and that's going to give you a really good background knowledge on different manta rays on their conservation um, as well. And all the devil rays, yeah. It's, yeah uh, and I think it's, you know, it's written with my colleagues, Giuseppe and Daniel uh, and Mark Dando. We, you know, we put a lot of effort into it. And I think that a lot of the questions we've had today, a lot of the things that most of you will be interested in, hopefully it's in here. I hope you like it. Um, and um, we've got links to this on our website as well. Yeah, so you can go and get the book from the website, you can follow us on social media, and you can help support Manta Research by supporting us joining the Cyclone, which is a members-only hub where you can see all of our latest uh, research, all of our latest expeditions. Um, you can adopt a Manta, there's loads of ways that you can help, um, and you can learn loads more on that website. We do have loads of really cool talks coming up. The next one is on Friday, um, in two days' time, it will be at three o'clock uh, UK time, so three o'clock BST. And that is talking with Tam Sawyers. She is our Maldivian manta ray project leader. She has been working in the Maldives for a few years with the mantas there. And she's gonna tell us about the biggest population of reef mantas in the world. Um, so I saw a lot of questions come through about the Maldives. So some of you can come back and ask some of your questions. For Tam. Um, but for now, I'd like to say a big thanks to all of you for joining us for all of your awesome questions. And thank you to Guy for answering them so well. Well, my pleasure. Thank you, Fossi, also for, for hosting this. And um, yeah, everyone, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, I hope you're all doing, doing well under these uh, crazy times. Stay safe and thank you for following the Manta Trust. Yeah, thank you guys. If you haven't had your questions answered, um, you can email us at our info email. 
um, and we will try and get back to you to answer your questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get around to everybody's today. Um, okay, yep. thanks guys and see you soon. Yeah, take care everyone. Bye-bye, thanks Flossie.